this class, we're just going to look at uh, the life of, of, of Master Samuel. We're going to do a little bit about biography for him. And it's a, it's a difficult class to do, and it's always a class I never really felt um, comfortable doing because I didn't know him. And in the movement today, there's uh, in various Gnostic centers, there's people that actually personally knew him or more recently personally knew his wife as well. I didn't, you know, I'm just relying here on, on the little bit of information that's been written about his early life and anecdotal tales that people have told about him. So it's always been a little bit of a, a difficult class for me to do because, like I said, I didn't really personally know him. But there are people still in our movement to this day that knew him, that experienced what it was like to, to be around him, that heard him speak. Um, if you're interested, you can find all kinds of videos online of him speaking. A lot of them are in uh, Spanish, but a fair number of them have been subtitled as well. So you can really, you know, watch him speak and get a sense of, of who he was. Uh, this is one of his quotes that I really like. I do not follow anyone, nor do I want anyone to follow me. What I want is for each one of you to follow his own self. I am only a lighthouse in the sea of existence. Or in other things, situations, he would say, I'm just a beggar dressed in a tuxedo. The idea being, he didn't want to be idolized. He didn't want to be put upon a pedestal and, you know, um, worshipped like a, a Jesus or a Buddha or something like that. What he was basically saying is, I'm just a messenger here to give humanity a message. What you need to do is not follow me, but follow the message. And if you're looking for someone to follow, follow your, your inner self, follow your, your higher self because that was what the important part of his message really was, not to, you know, idolize or worship another human being, but to, you know, worship the inner divinity that we carry inside all of us. And that's a really important quote for me because uh, you see all kinds of strange behavior um, in spiritual movements when they become cults, when there's some figure that has to be followed and obeyed and worshipped and that kind of stuff, some sort of a, a false prophet, and he kind of avoided that whole thing by saying, don't follow me follow the teachings. He's only a lighthouse in the sea of existence. Um, his early childhood, there's not a lot known about it. Um, he was born Victor Manuel Gomez Rodriguez in Santa Fe de Bogota, Colombia in 1917. Okay, so he was born as a regular person, just like you and just like I. He wasn't born into an amazing life the way Jesus was. He was born just a regular, this is his human name, that was his regular human personality that he had for the early stages of his life. So he wasn't born into anything special, he wasn't born into a position of influence, or he wasn't born into a wealthy family or a prestigious family. He was just born some average guy like everybody else. And that for me, of all the different masters and paths that you can follow, that was one of the things that really appealed to me about Gnosis and about Master Samael. He was a regular guy. He didn't have, you know, angels heralding his arrival with stars and wise men and all that kind of stuff. He was just a regular person who in one lifetime took himself from a fallen state and then was able to elevate himself quite high. Um, one of the advantages that he had as a, a younger person is he was able to astral travel and he had a clairvoyance developed. And you think, well, you know, that's kind of a bit of a, an advantage over other people, but a lot of children are like that as well, right? There's a lot of people that can astral project at an early age and they just don't really know what they're doing. So he had a little bit of a, a help up in that he was able to astral travel and he had uh, a certain degree of clairvoyance active as well. Uh, as a child, he was actually able to remember a lot of his past lives. He remembered chunks and you know, pieces of existences that he had before he was born. Uh, when he was a teenager, he was able to practice profound meditation with the help of his great powers of concentration. Okay, so he was able to start, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail, uh, he was able to start working with meditation quite early in life, in his, his early teens, which is, you know, I think you can imagine uh, really a, a, quite an advantage growing up as a teenager to have that kind of concentration and that kind of focus. That's something that was able to uh, come a bit more naturally to him than perhaps other people. He had great powers of concentration, so he was able to, to practice profound meditation from an early age. Uh, he was fascinated with books. He was fascinated with books on religion and books on philosophy and books on esotericism and the occult and that kind of stuff. And he spends a lot of time reading. He has a library at home, and libraries in general fascinate him. So as a kid, that's what he liked to do. He liked to read books and go to libraries, as opposed to reading like Hardy Boys novels and that kind of stuff. He's reading world religions. 
he's reading books on esotericism. He's reading books written by mm -hmm. um, people like the Rosicrucians and the Golden Dawn and these other movements that were spreading esoteric knowledge at the time. This is the kind of stuff that he's reading and he's absorbing. And he doesn't show at this early age, he doesn't show any one preference towards any spiritual movement over another one. He's kind of just absorbing a huge wealth of knowledge from all different walks of life, all different religions, different spiritualities. He's reading about, you know, <coughs> world, different civilizations and their myths and the fables and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he was raised in a Catholic family and he loved being the acolyte in the church. The acolyte's like the altar boy, right? So he's raised in a Catholic family, as was a lot of people in Colombia at the time. It was a very strong Catholic influence due to the Spanish background. And one of the things he enjoyed was being an boy in the church. Um, one of the things that happens in his teenage years, because he's been soaking in all this knowledge, all this you know, comparative religion stuff, he suddenly starts to put the pieces together. He kind of stumbles upon the, wait a sec, all the world's religions, cultures, and civilizations, they're telling the same story over and over again. It's just some sort of hidden truth that's being expressed again and again and again. So I guess you could think of it as in his teenage years, he started doing a comparative religious study and arrived at a universal truth that he found behind all religions. Okay, just because that's what he was engrossed in, studying as many different religions as possible. And when you think about the way a lot of people are raised, it's you have the religion of the family and that's it. That's what you're raised in. He had the advantage of being able to take in and, and digest all this information from all these different cultures and different religions. And then he discovers there's a common denominator behind everything. And that common denominator becomes the hidden truth that he sees everywhere. So where he develops with this, thinking about all these different religions, the concept of compared religions, the concept of really all religions are telling the same story, just like every language expresses um, different objects with different words. He basically discovers, with working with intuition, that all religions are really telling the same story. And he gets back to that, that hidden truth, that original wisdom, the gnosis, right? Gnosis is simply the word for wisdom. And that's what he gets to, down to the original wisdom. Peels back all the layers of all the religions, and all the dogma and history and that kind of stuff and gets down to this original wisdom. Uh, he intensively studies all the classics of world literature, ancient legends, holy scriptures from all over the world. He's just pouring through this stuff, digesting this stuff to discover as much as he can. And keep in mind, he's still a teenager here, right? What most people do when they're teenagers now, you play video games, you get drunk, go to school, <laughs> right? This is what this guy's doing in his spare time. And keep in mind, at this point, he's just an average, he's just a person, Victor Ramon Gomez. He's not anything special. He's doing some really interesting things in his spare time, mind you. But at this point, he's not, he's not a awakened consciousness, consciousness. He's, he's not a master. He's just a really inquisitive teenager that has some latent abilities, like caster projection, a great concentration, a sense of clairvoyance and intuition, and he arrives at some, some truths that he discovers on his own. Uh, he tours various schools and studies with various teachers. He tries almost everything. He's briefly involved with spiritualism and spiritism, mediumism, enchantments, prayers. He's basically studying everything that he can, going to every different religious group and, and basically trying them out, for lack of a better term. All different kinds of teachers, different paths in life. Later on, he kind of settles down in this Theosophical Society. That's the society with uh, the um, Madame Blavatsky is famous for, Rudolf Steiner. He settles down in the Theosophical Society, and he reads and masters the secret doctrine and other works of um, the Theosophists, like Ledbetter, Steiner, Blavatsky, and that kind of stuff. And you can see, actually, when you read his works, he sometimes makes references to these other people that have written these books. And Blavatsky was an interesting one. She was a, a, a Russian woman that was probably a, an awakened master as well. Um, so there's some similarities in what she was talking about and what Master Samael talks about, because they're still expressing some universal principles as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, I found really fascinating, because I've read some of this stuff, the thing that really interested me with Master Samael is how plainly and how simply he says it. I mean, I have a, a quite an extensive collection at home of books on the esoteric subjects and the cult and stuff like that. I've been reading them for years, but they never made sense to me. I have like all these books and I would read some of these you know, so-called masters from people like the Theosophists, the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, all these people, and it didn't make any sense. And then the Master Samael, when he came along, he unveiled the teachings. He took away all the 
complexity and the mysticism and just pulled that veil off and went, there it is. That's what you need to know. You don't need to be a member of a secret society. You don't need to you know, buy your way in or anything else like that. You don't need to pour through ancient texts and decode language. At one point I was teaching myself how to read and write Hebrew because I figured that I had to get to the secret knowledge, right? And then along comes Master Sam Allen and says, there it is. It's, it's right there. There's nothing you need to do. You just need to read it and understand it. Uh, so he received the Theosophical Diploma, the Theosophical Society. There's actually one in London, believe it or not. Um, he received the diploma from them, basically completing their course. And then at the age of 17, he's now one of their teachers. So he's actually lecturing for them, which is really pretty impressive when you think of 17 compared to the average 17 year old today, what they're basically doing, right? So by the age of 17, he's now um, lecturing in the Theosophical Society. He's one of the teachers there after receiving the diploma and studying with them. Uh, at age 18, now he goes to the Rosicrucians, which is another kind of, of hidden school, another kind of school of wisdom, an esoteric school. Um, despite his encounters with many schools, he explains that his heart was crying for something more profound. So he's now studied all these different religions and yeah, gets to some theories about uh, hidden truths and universal wisdom and that kind of stuff, and then goes looking for something more profound. Spends a ton of time in the Theosophical Society, rises up through the ranks, gets the diploma, teaches there for a while, and goes, yeah, it's, it's not here. This is not what I'm looking for. So goes and tries out the Rosicrucians for a while, um, which is another esoteric movement, and he decides that, no, there's, there's something else missing. It's like all these schools were missing a very important piece of the puzzle. He was able to study, he was able to learn a lot, he was able to teach, but there's something else missing. There's something else there. They weren't complete. The knowledge wasn't complete. So up until this point, by age 18, he's fully remembered his past lives. He was an athlete of meditation, um, experiencing the super dimensions, or sorry, the superior dimensions frequently, and started to focus more on astral travel, where he begins to receive direct knowledge from his guru. When he starts focusing on astral travel, eventually he encounters a teacher in the higher dimensions. And that prompts him later on to write a book called Secret Conversations with a Guru about the teachings he receives. Um, one of the things he's able to do by being an athlete of meditation is he was able at an early age to experience the illuminated void. Remember we looked at the mantra Gate Gate for that and, and talked a little bit about the illuminated void is he was able to submerge himself quite deeply and have that profound experience in the illuminated void which just gave him that extra drive, that extra push to find out what it was that he was needing to find out that profound piece of information that he was missing. Okay, but this is why we push astral travel as well and talk about the importance of astral travel because in the end, you've heard the expression when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So many people make that assumption that there's going to be a physical person they're going to run into. They're going to go to a classroom somewhere or take a course and meet somebody who's going to teach them. In the end, there's a strong likelihood that your teacher isn't going to be a teacher in a physical body, in the physical dimension. It's somebody that you're going to encounter in the higher dimensions. And that's exactly what happened to him. What he called his guru was an intelligence in the higher dimensions that started teaching him. So there's a range of 18 to 28. Um, that's when the period when he had his first experience of the illuminated void, and he meets his inner being. He meets his, his higher self, for lack of a better term, uh, whose name is Unvior. Um, and at, keep in mind, at this point, he is Victor Manuel Gomez. Okay? He's a guy called Victor Manuel Gomez. Um, by this time, he also rediscovered the wonderful keys of sexual magic. That was the profound secret that he was searching for. That was the missing piece of the puzzle that nobody else was teaching. Okay? And for him, uh, the way he described it, it wasn't so much he learned it as he had to remember it. This knowledge he had from a previous existence, he just lost it. So he describes having the secret in ancient Egypt. He originally learned the secret of alchemy in ancient Egypt, and it has been forgotten for all those lifetimes. Okay, so at this point, uh, when he starts writing, he actually signs his books on Vior, as opposed to calling himself Victor Manuel Gomez. Okay, and we'll talk a little about that later. So he goes through two stages. He starts writing books under on Vior, and later on adds the Samael in front. Uh, he was able to verify the key, so he starts experimenting. He discovers the key works, um, which would open the doors of the internal worlds for him. Surprisingly, he discovered <coughs> the same modus operandi in the Mayan and Aztec cultures in Tibet, India, Europe, and so on. He starts to see, once he uh, remembers this key, he starts to see it everywhere. One of those uh, expressions of how do you hide something, you know, put it in plain view when nobody notices, that kind of thing. He comes across the key of sexual magic. 
is able to verify it and then discovers that key basically has existed in all the world's religions. There's been various forms of it. It's always been kind of secret. And if you remember back to talking about the class on alchemy and uh, the development of the solar bodies, we looked at you know the hidden symbolism of the concept of alchemy and the, how it appeared in the you know, Karma Sutra of the Hindus and all those different cultures. That's basically what we're talking about here. Uh, in his 30s, he meets uh, his wife, um, Arnoldo Garamora, who also possessed inner extraordinary powers. That's Litalantis, okay, his wife Litalantis. Um, now, before that, uh, keep in mind that he's still basically just a regular guy. Now, he's experienced a lot of things, he's learning a lot of things, but he hasn't yet incarnated the principles of, of Samael, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and in his early years, he... You know, when he was in his 20s, um, he was just an average person, okay? He, he, he was um, nothing special. He wasn't like, you know, gifted or wealthy or anything else like that. He was just your average guy, just like, just like you or just like me, and was able to bring himself all the way up, was able to elevate himself to a really high state, which I think is something that's, that's you know, really in, in important to think about or reflect on because he's left us the key that says we can do this in a single lifetime. We don't have to be born into a, a privileged set of circumstances. Anybody can do this. Anybody can raise themselves up. Uh, now, she teaches him the Jin science. And we haven't gone into this yet. You guys are going to look at that in phase C. Uh, Jin science is basically the ability to take the physical body into the higher dimensions. And when you look at uh, stories like Jesus being able to walk on water and a lot of masters perform miracles, that's the key that they're using. They're able to transfer their physical body into the higher dimensions. So it's not just your, you know, consciousness that drifts off into the astral. You can actually pull your whole physical body in. This is like one of the crowning glory of all the practices that somebody can learn to master. And Litalantis was the one that taught him that. Taught him how to transfer his physical body into the astral and explore the higher dimensions of this physical body, which is a really interesting thing. We haven't talked about this, and that's something that's going to be in, in phase C. Um, now, we we've, haven't really talked much about her, but really that was uh, one of the key moments of, in his life, was him meeting his wife, because that was the person that was really able to help him and elevate him on the path. And she, too, was an awakened master. She was one of the judges of the law in a physical body. That's what her higher self was for lack of a better term. So she was one of the, the judges of the law. Remember we talked about Anubis and the judges of the law on the sides of justice and mercy? That's where she was. Um, she allowed him to work extensively with alchemy because now he has a partner, right? So he's got somebody that he can work with alchemy with. And as we talked last week when we looked at the um, initiation of the minor mysteries and major mysteries and the three mounds and all that stuff. Remember one of the things that we said was if we're working in alchemy with a partner we can progress quite rapidly through those initiations and at this point this is what he's able to do. Uh, in his 30s he writes his first book, The Entry Door to Initiation, uh, March 1950. Around 1953 he's already published three books the Perfect Marriage, or Entrance to the Initiation, which is that one, The Revolution of Bell, or The Revolution of Bells Above, and Secret Notes of a Guru. Um, and this is where he, when he first starts writing books, he draws a lot of attention to himself, and he faces a lot of persecution. Um, remember that this is, this is Colombia, this is a, a very heavily Catholic dominated society in the 50s. It was really difficult to write and talk about esoteric things to write and talk about the occult without being accused of being a, you know, some sort of cultist or devil worshiper or something like that. And keep in mind that some of the things that he's writing about are things like alchemy, sexual magic, in the 50s, in a heavily oppressed Catholic society. That tends to draw a lot of attention to oneself. And he had some uh, negative experiences with that as well. Uh, the Sun Supreme Sanctuary is built. It's an underground temple built in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, the Sun Supreme Sanctuary is like the ultimate, it's like the temple of all temples, if you think of it that way. Um, what's really interesting is the Sun Supreme Sanctuary for the whole Gnostic movement is currently in Canada, in, in Quebec, which is kind of cool. You've been, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you been, crew? No, I've not. No, I haven't been either. Have you been? 
Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 you haven't. Over HBank. And you can actually go, that's really interesting. Um, so they, they basically build this, this underground temple, they actually build it into a mountain, and this is the, the central spot where all the, you know, the big Gnostic volumes of the time um, meet to do all kinds of rituals and practices that are designed to help humanity, to bring uh, you know, a global revolution of awakening of consciousness. So that's what the Supreme, the Sum Supreme Sanctuary is. Uh, around 1953, the persecution start, which is what I was hinting at, right? The church, the police, the priests, they look for the immoral one, which is what he's labeled as. And he's basically being accused of being a pornographer. He's actually um, thrown in jail for a short period of time because of his writings, because of speaking out. He's, he's very vocal, and he's really speaking um, a lot about revolution, which the political people don't like. <laughs> Right, especially in, in countries, they don't want to talk. They don't want to talk about revolution. He's trying to set up new systems of government. He's trying to set up new systems of healthcare. He's trying to set up new systems of social welfare and social justice. So he wasn't really um, just kind of like an esoteric figure. He at one point was almost a political figure, and actually started a, a political movement of his own. Um, so he was drawing a lot of attention from all kinds of people, from, from the, the, the church, obviously because of what he was saying about religion. I mean, in many of his books, he outright just says, like, the Catholic religion, it's, it's the dead religion, it's the dead word. The people have lost meaning, it's like a dead end, basically, because they don't teach the three factors for the evolution of the consciousness. So here he is in the 50s, speaking out against the government, speaking out against the church. So he gets himself in a little bit of hot water. So he quickly leaves for Sierra Nevada. October 27th, 1954, that's when he incarnates his inner Christ. And every October 27th to the Gnostics, it's kind of like, it's kind of like almost like a, like a holiday thing. And the last 27th, which was last week, everybody here in Second Chamber got together for a little special kind of celebration for this, this same moment as well. So at this point, he actually gives birth to his inner Christ. He incarnates that principle. Um, as far as the Summum Supreme Sanctuary in uh, Sierra Nevada, eventually the army gets there and kind of blows everything up. Kind of come destroys everything and chases them all away, believe it or not. Um, at this point, Un Vior becomes Samael Un Vior. So he's Victor Manuel Gomez, and then later on he signs his books as Un Vior, and after this point he signs his books as Samael Un Vior. Uh, this is a, there's been stellar moments for mankind in which the sidereal father of a great genie has been able to speak and express himself through a regular person. Okay? So Samael was the sidereal father, was the great genie, the monad of Victor Manuel Gomez. It's said there are many fathers in heaven as there are people on the earth. Okay? We each have a connection to our, our, our own inner father. There's been moments in mankind where that elevated, spiritually perfect being is able to express itself, or himself, or herself, they want to think of it, through an average person. And that's what was happening. Samael was Master Samael's higher self, his, his father. And at this point, when he incarnates that Christic principle, that's able to speak through him. So that's when he's writing the books, and when he's speaking to people. And he would say in his lectures, speaking to you now is Samael. Okay, and he'd basically be saying, I'm not Manuel Gomez, Victor Manuel Gomez, I'm not talking to you. My, this higher principle is speaking through me, or is, is writing the books. Um, because in the end, he wrote over 75 books in a period of less than 20-some years, which is a pretty impressive feat. And what's actually happening here is Samael is speaking through him in order to initiate a new cycle of spiritual culture. Because around about this time, we're talking about the dawning of the age of Aquarius, right? The new spiritual age. And we're kind of at the tail end of that. And it's said that the Gnosis is the religion of the next golden age. It's really a religion that's going to be in place, who knows, maybe 40, 50, 100 years from now. We've just been given a sneak peek of the new religion that's going to form with the new... Um, that's lucky. <laughs> we 
we've been given a sneak peek at the religion that's going to be for the next um, the next golden age, for lack of a term, when this humanity goes through that whole period of turmoil and cleansing, and the golden age begins, it's really the gnosis that's going to bring that next golden age in. We've been fortunate enough just to grab onto the tail end of that. So that's what we mean by initiating a, a new cycle of spiritual culture. Uh, this is him speaking. I, Samael Vior, am the only child monad and the instrument of Samael Mars. And what I need to teach you is the wisdom of my stellar father. Now, remember this in Power 3 Create, the Law 7 Organized? There's seven cosmo creators, often termed seven archangels. Michael's one, Gabriel's one, Raphael's one, Uriel's one, and Samael is one. And Samael is actually associated with the intelligence of the planet Mars. And plan, the planet Mars, you tend to think of it like war, but what that really represents is strength. So Samael is a master of strength. He's from the ray of strength. That's basically the, the, the path that he's on. Okay, so this is what he's telling us is that this higher principle, this, this cosmo creator, this archangel, is speaking through him at that point with a message for us. The first man is of the earth, the second man is the Lord from heaven. And that's um, right from Corinthians. Uh, the first man of the earth is this flesh and bone body, right? But we're connected to something else. The second man, the, the true self, the higher self, is the Lord from heaven, is, is the, the father that we carry within. And as I said earlier, there's as many lords or fathers in heaven as there are people on the earth. That's who we're, we're connected to, that higher principle up there. And in um, some important situations, or if there's a message that we can connect, or if we can elevate ourselves up to that point, then that principle can speak through us and give a message to humanity. If you're curious what the name means, it's, it's Hebrew in origin, and that's how you pronounce it, Samael on Veor. Uh, un is Hebrew for, or Eun is Hebrew for sexual strength. Veor, or pronounced that way, Veor, means and light. So, whoops, if you look at it this way, it's Samael of sexual strength and light. It would, of course, be the light of the consciousness. We looked at that principle of Mars, the strength, and the thing that he unveiled for humanity was alchemy, right? That was the key that he gave everybody. It wasn't that it, he invented alchemy. Alchemy had always been there, but it was reserved for the spiritual elite. It was the secret that was kept in all the temples and all the religions and only handed out to the very few initiates that were worthy to know the secret. What Samael did is, is unveil that for all of humanity. It didn't, didn't matter who you were, where you were from, what culture, what religion. He gave that key to everybody. So in the last phase of this race, we can all work towards elevating ourselves. Uh, Samael is the great cosmic intelligence who is responsible for the spiritual development of this current humanity. He's the teacher that has the responsibility of developing the age of Aquarius. And that's why at that point in time, he had to speak to us and give us a message. Uh, his son, the Bodhisattva Samael Unvior, fell into disgrace for many centuries. Now this is interesting because if you look at some of the teachings of especially the, uh, in the Hebraic um, tradition, Judaism, Samael appears as the angel of death. He's a very negative thing. Okay, whereas Michael's a, a glorious angel and Raphael's a glorious angel. Uh, for the Jewish people, Samael and the angel of death are basically interchangeable. And if you translate Samael, um, what you get is poison of God. Because Ael means of God, so like Raphael and Oriel and you know, Michael, Michael is strength of God, Oriel is light of God, Samael was poison of God. Um, and he was kind of seen as the angel of death. He was the one that would go out and, and collect the souls and all that kind of stuff. Um, so when you read a lot about Samael, it comes across as quite negative. You think, well, wait a second, I thought he's supposed to be this teacher for humanity, but, you know, back up from 1950 and go back a couple thousand years, every time Samael appears, he's like the angel of death, he's like this negative character. What's wrong with that? Another interesting aspect of Samael is he was fallen. He was a fallen bodhisattva. Okay, so he was somebody that was at a much higher level than us and basically fell all the way down and had to climb right back up again. 
Okay, so we have to remember that he was a fallen bodhisattva. He fell into disgrace. And he stayed in that lower state for a long period of time. And that's why you see teachings that refer to Samael basically as a fallen angel, because that's what he was. And his book, Revolution, um, uh, sorry, what is it, uh, Revolution of Beelzebub, um, what that's about, Beelzebub's another kind of uh, bad guy, a kind of demon sort of thing. And that book is about helping that angel rise as well. One of the things Master Samael did was help the fallen angel Beelzebub rise back up. Okay, so we have a huge advantage because we're not even, you know, we're not even about fallen angels or that kind of stuff. And here's a guy that's able to do that to raise himself up to that level. So that's why if you're curious, and I mean, there's a couple of classes ago that we started and somebody sent us this huge email saying, you know, I looked into what you guys do and, you know, Samael is kind of your, sort of your guru or your leader or whatever. And, you know, he, this is what this means and how can you follow this? Are you guys like, you know, like devil worshippers or something like that? So Wolfgang and I had to write this huge response back to the guy explaining the meaning of that. Because at one point he does fall. He was a fallen bodhisattva that raised himself back up. So looking at ancient cultures in that time when he was fallen, uh, the angel Samael doesn't appear in a very good light. And this is Master Samael describing that process. I ended up transforming myself into a fallen angel. Many eagles were surged within my mind and I became transformed into a true devil. Now in this present existence, I comprehend the necessity of eliminating my egos, the necessity of performing the great work of the Father. Therefore, this is why today I am here speaking to you all with my hand placed on my heart. Samael in Vior is my true name as a Bodhisattva. Samael is the name of my monad. Okay, so here's him himself describing that process. Of, so what is a monad? And what is a Bodhisattva? A monad is like, like our Father in heaven. Oh. Okay, that's like the highest portion of our self, for lack of a better term, is, is our, our, our monad, who we are. The bodhisattva is like the small piece of that that falls. Okay, if you want to think of it that way. From, from the monad? Yeah, from okay. the top. In, in, Buddhist, in Buddhism, a bodhisattva is actually somebody that's reached um, <coughs> Buddhahood, but by his own choice comes back to Earth to help humanity get to that stage. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. But if you're a fallen bodhisattva, yeah, you're not. You can come down to the surface, you can't get up. <coughs> so, going back to in his 30s, by 1957, he's published about 20 books. Um, Treaties of Alchemy was a big one, Treaties of Occult Medicine or Practical Magic. Something else that he does that's interesting, he goes off into the jungles of Columbia and lives with some of the Aboriginal cultures. And if you ever get a chance to look at any of these books, um, which, if you like, I don't know if I've ever told you, there's a CD here that we have, it's kind of like, you know, donation, if you want one. It's every book that he wrote in English, in PDF format. Mm -hmm. So, if you're ever curious, um, mm -hmm. Treaties of Occult Medicine and Practical Magic, it's an interesting book because it's all about um, working with plants and healing various ailments and various rituals involving plants and that kind of stuff. And this is basically the, the knowledge that he amassed while studying all these, um, with all these medicine men and shamans and that kind of stuff of Colombia and the Amazon. Um, Zodiacal Course, Logos Mantra Theodry, Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, Igneous Rose, for some of the uh, more, I don't want to say more popular books, but if you're looking for them in English, these ones are easy to find. Unfortunately, out of 75 books, not all of them have made it into English. And a lot, the, some of them that are in English, the translations are not that great either. And there's Gnostic centers around the world that are working to get as many books into English as possible. And actually Wolfgang does a bunch of that, translates books. And um, he's translated a couple and I've helped him do some editing on some and we're hoping to get them to somebody that could publish them. That's why if you're looking at Gnostic books, every like we have the Great Rebellion over there and it's about, there's six different versions of the same book and they all look different because they're all independently published by small runs of various centers around the world. That's kind of what happens. But are they all the tr same translator? Uh, no, and this is no. a thing that, maybe I shouldn't say, but frustrates me endlessly. People keep retranslating the same stuff over and over again to make their versions. And there's so much of his works that aren't available in English. And every time I say, do we really need another version of revolutionary psychology? Can't somebody go and you know try working with some other stuff? But the biggest publisher is probably Thelema Press, and um, 
what makes them the biggest is they now uh, distribute through Amazon. So they have a good number of his books through Amazon, and the books are really well put together. They're very well translated. They're full of illustrations and nice to read. Some of the books that, that, that I have in my collection are really short-run, kind of cheaply made. You know, the, some of the pages are a little bit difficult to read and the font sizes and that kind of stuff. But in the last few years, Stalin Press has been doing some really interesting <coughs> stuff in publishing. And they've got this stuff into basically mainstream. Like I said, there, if you look up some L and view on Amazon, it's all their stuff that you find, which is a big deal for the, the Gnostic movement to have the material that accessible through the world's largest um, distributor of books. Uh, in 1960, The Message of Aquarius is published in El Salvador, and for the first time, the greatness of St. John's Revelation is unveiled. You guys will see more about this in some of the Phase C classes, but that was a, a, a kind of a, a big landmark, that particular book. February 4, 1962, The Perfect Matrimony is published. The revolutionary concept of the doctrine of the many eyes is introduced. Because he first kind of starts writing about alchemy. That was the first thing, that was the first secret he discovered. He gets really excited and he writes about alchemy. But as time goes on, um, he discovers that people really aren't changing. People really, they're spending too much time on alchemy and that they're not really understanding the concept of the ego and the psychology. And that's where he brings that up for the first time. The Perfect Matrimony is the big white book down there, if you're interested. It's a, one of his books that you definitely have to have if you want to you know, learn more about this stuff. It's a, it's a really good book. Is that on the CD as well? Yeah. Yeah. How do you put them all on that one? Yeah. The PDFs are small, right? Text documents are really tiny. Mm -hmm. As far as how much space they take on a computer, is anyone with an e-reader can attest. You get thousands of books on an e-reader, right? Text mm -hmm. documents don't really take up much space. I don't like stuff on a computer because my eyes go crazy trying to read it on the screen. Mm -hmm. I like sitting down on the couch with a book. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm old fashioned that way. But if you do have an e-reader, you definitely want that CD. You can throw all the books on there and go through them. So you have to have an e-reader? like a, uh, uh, You can do it on a laptop. You can do it on any computer. You just glue it to your computer screen. That's all. What program? It's what PDF. It? Adobe Acrobat. Oh, Adobe, yeah. okay. There was a student a couple years ago that I got the CD and like went to a printer and it was a boat. $65 or something like that, and had them all printed and, and bound together. So he had his own versions of, of every yeah, book. Mm. If you're just into doing that kind of thing, you could definitely do that. It's just hundreds and hundreds of pages to print, that's all. Uh, in his later years, so 1972, uh, he doesn't stop writing books. He's just cranking out books all the time. And he almost goes into uh, what almost appears like automatic writing when he writes books. I mean, it used to drive his wife crazy because he'd get stuck and he'd just write and he'd run out of paper and he'd write on the wall and he'd write on anything that was around him just to get the message out. Because when that, when his, when that monad wanted to speak to him, it was like, I don't need to speak now. It was like, oh, just start writing. And she'd like chase him around with papers to make him write on the paper because he'd write on anything that was around him. Just writing nonstop. And there's some pictures of him and it almost looks like he's almost like in a trance-like state, just, just writing rapidly page after page after page, and later on he switches to a typewriter. Uh, he sends some workers to the International Congress, so this is a uh, political movement in his country, laying out the guidelines and solutions for various problems. He's trying to address pollution, cancer, traffic, that kind of thing. And like I said, he gets to the point where he's uh, almost running in as a political figure. Okay, he's developing a, a, like a political mm -hmm. movement. He encourages the foundation of the Institute of Universal Charity, which becomes a real charitable group in that country. So the foundation for the Institute of Universal Charity, it's like a great charity organization that helps the poor, that helps help um, with um, health care and that kind of stuff. By this time, he realizes that the Gnostics have not grasped the, meet, the full meaning of his doctrine. They've worked hard with one factor of the revolution of the consciousness, totally ignoring the other ones. Everybody gets excited about alchemy and forgets to balance it with death and sacrifice. Okay, and he's standing there before his, his, his followers, his group. And keep in mind, here in Canada, um, you go to a Gnostic center and there's 15 people in a room. At a time in his home country, you had a movement that measured in the millions. Like he would land in places, you've seen the shot of the Beatles where they get off the plane and there's like a ton of people. It was like that for him. 
the airport would fly, not the country flag, they would fly the Gnostic flag when he was arriving. What year was that? Um, that was in the 60s, 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, yeah. So it's kind of hard to, to put that in perspective because in Canada we can't imagine. I mean, you look at a Gnostic center and you know, even the big Gnostic centers in this country, you're talking about you know, 50 to 60 people. We're not talking centers and movements measured in hundreds of thousands of people, which in its prime down there, that's what it was like. It was huge. It was absolutely huge because it was so many, he was doing so many good things, so many works of charity, so many things to improve the state of the country and the life of the people in the country. He was a, a very popular figure and his, his doctrine was everywhere. So what he does is, at this point, he's standing before and he's going, you know, I've been doing this now for 25 years and I've seen people that have been following me for 25 years and you haven't changed. You haven't really changed. You're forgetting about the psychology. You're still carrying the same egos, and they're always going to hold you back. So he really, at this point in time, the books, everything he starts to do, really has a, a heavy bent towards working with the death of the ego. And he's really trying to hammer that, that subject home. Everybody's spending all the time working with alchemy and all that kind of stuff, totally forgetting about the death and the sacrifice. He then refines the teaching for the dissolution of the ego and prepares books related to human psych or related to human psychology. So all of his books really take that uh, psychological bent. He really stresses the ego, and he started starts to tour Mexico and lectures become a routine. He's like a minor celebrity at this point, going from city to city to city, speaking to huge groups of people, making a, he's making television appearances, he was making radio appearances, just getting that message out everywhere. It's, it's really an interesting thing to see. And like I said, you can go on YouTube and you can have a look at some of these television appearances. It's almost like uh, imagining um, someone of, of his background appearing on like David Letterman or the Jay Leno show to talk about his books. Not just, a, you know, tabloids and rock stars, but here's this person talking about esoteric things. Talking about the three factors, talking about the ego and alchemy uh, openly on TV, openly in the media. Uh, so Holy Week 1976, uh, he receives a group of people from Central America who are able to witness various amazing phenomenon. Um, so he starts doing, for the small group of people, uh, really strange things. Um, one of the stories is uh, they want to go meditate. There's some uh, like pyramids or temples in the jungle, and they want to go and meditate in them, but it's pouring rain. And he gets out of the car, does what he does, stops the rain, they all go to do the meditation, they get back to the car, it starts raining again. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, um, for small groups of people, he starts performing, I don't want to use the term miracles, but he is able to demonstrate that he's a lot more than just a regular human being that knows a few things about esoteric studies. Uh, October 27, 1976, um, the Americans get a hold of them. They're like, you seem pretty popular, we must be able to cash in on this somehow. And they want to give him a monthly salary. Okay, so they want to set him up, give him a monthly salary, and, and start making him almost like a celebrity, and people want to cash in on that, right? He responds with, look at my hands. They are deformed from the hours I've spent typing books. When I'm no longer able to do this anymore, I will learn to type with my toes. I will never accept a salary. I'm just a beggar dressed in a tuxedo. So at this point, he basically refuses money. He refuses anything other than you know, what he's already doing. And there's some pictures of his hands, and his hands are just, they're like arthritic and gnarled from an old school typewriter, like nonstop. 75 books on an old school typewriter. I mean, it's so easy nowadays if we're processing and editors. This is one guy doing it himself. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours spent typing at a typewriter. Um, another interesting thing to mention, uh, if you sometimes see it, if you open the books, um, around about this time, people are trying to start copywriting things, right? And make money off of that. And he comes forward and he says, I now and forever and will always renounce all copyrights. Anybody, anywhere is free to publish my books and do whatever they want with them. All I ask is you do so at a really cheap cost, so even a person that's just got a few pennies in their pocket can afford the books. Okay, so think of how many um, publishers have published or writers have made 75 books and not made a penny off them and publicly renounced copyrights for all of them. That's why all these small independent centers can keep putting out the books, can keep making short runs of the books because you don't have to pay anybody copyright. 
They're in public domain because the author said publicly they're available for everybody. No copyrights, do what you want with them, which is, is pretty, a uh, pretty phenomenal thing to do. So he's basically refusing any money for his works. Um, and at this point, he, he has nothing. He's just wandering around, talking to people, making appearances. Um, you know, he's not making a million dollars. He's not making any money from this whatsoever. He's just, you know, people are giving him what he needs to survive, you know, lodging and food and that kind of stuff. But he's definitely not in this for the money. Then August 1977, uh, he gets sick. So his physical body is literally starting to wear out at this point. One of the messages that he said later in his life is, don't forget you have to take care of your physical body. He neglected his for years. because his, He was so enthralled in the teaching and writing books and making appearances, he wasn't taking care of his physical body. He wasn't eating properly, he wasn't sleeping properly. He was literally burning his physical body out. Except he's like touring like a rock star, if you think of it that way, but he's in his late 60s. That's okay. when my daughter was born, August 77. I was three. Mm -hmm. August what? I was three in 77. You were three, oh. I was three, yeah. Uh, October 1977, uh, he suffers unbearable pain, but does not stop any of his works, especially his crown and glory, what we call the Gnostic Bible, the Pistis Sophia unveiled. The Pistis Sophia is a really old book. It's an old Gnostic text. Uh, it's one of these things that you read it, and you're like, what? And you go back and you read the paragraph, and you're like, what? And they try it a third time, and I have no idea what's going on in this book. What he did, is he went, imagine the Bible, okay? You know, the Bible's kind of weird. And imagine somebody going through the Bible and chapter by chapter, verse by verse, telling you what it really means. That's what he did with the Peace to Sophia. He basically did one half of it. Went through, and you can read the original verses of the Peace to Sophia, and then the, his unveiling. He said, this is what this is about. This is what the symbolism means. And it's a, it's a pretty profound accomplishment. And that's why we call it the Gnostic Bible. Uh, I think that's on there, that CD. I was just wondering, what did, did he get sick? What happened to him? Like, stomach he, cancer. Oh, stomach cancer. Actually. Yeah. Um, you have to remember that one of the problems with being incarnated in a physical body is we have a physical body and we also carry mm -hmm. karma, mm -hmm. right? And even the masters pay karma. Remember the, the, the katansia, the superior? law and that's basically what happened to him he had some karma that he had to pay mm. and remember that um, sometimes there's karma that even the masters have to account for um strange phenomenon happened to people around him so things start to get really weird uh, his process continues in pain it is said that the ancient of days is removing every conscious atom out of his physical body um Lithuantis, his wife tries to get an answer from the judges of karma who according to her don't want to give any information um, there's all kinds of weird stuff happens. He's, there's specialists come from all around the world to try to save him, but he's really not interested in any of that. All he's doing is basically saying, I've worn out my physical body, I'm going to have to get another one. Mm -hmm. So this is basically that somehow speaking, okay, I've worn out this physical body, I'm going to need to get another one. I'm going to need to arrange for another body. So that's what we mean by he starts transferring every conscious atom out of that body to place it in another one later on, which is kind of weird. December 24th, 1977, he actually dies. Uh, his physical body dies anyways. Remember that the, the master never dies. It's Victor Manuel Gomez that dies. Right? Samuel Vior is not something that dies. It's Victor Manuel Gomez, the mm. physical body that dies. A resurrection ritual is performed. He receives the bread and the wine, opens his eyes a few times, and little Lantus wipes the tear of blood from his eyes. That's basically the process. So he died on Christmas Eve, which is an odd time to go. But. Speaking of his impending death, the master indicated he had worn out his physical body. It could no longer function. It could no longer support the energy, support the work that needed to be done. Because poor Victor Manuel, Victor Manuel Gomez at this time was just, just the physical body was worn out. He was reincarnating into another body to continue his work in secret in Asia and Europe, as many other masters had done before him. So he was busy. Sounded weird, but swapping bodies at this point. Yes? Um, what were some of the phenomena that was happening to people that was near him? Uh, just things like experiences, astral stuff, visions. Um, There's a strange story. A specialist comes to see him from Japan, and uh, Master Samuel didn't speak Japanese, but starts suddenly speaking to the guy in fluent Japanese. Just like really weird stuff like that. 
Um, during the whole process, he kept saying, I'll be back, I'll be back. So he wasn't done teaching humanity, he was going to be returning to continue somewhere else. Yes? Do you think he was born, like, right after that? Well, that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to do it consciously. <laughs> so as opposed to having to start from the bottom, he was actually going to reincarnate. Remember, there's return or recurrence, we return, but a master reincarnates. They choose where, they choose how, and they come back with that, with that consciousness awoken. Oh, so that's what he was doing at, at, at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so, would, oh, I'm sorry, would he come back in, in a baby, or was he going to come back in a... Uh, well, he's going to, he needs to he needs start physical. the baby, and then yeah, oh, okay. he needs a physical body. Okay, he started, yeah. just start to find a wife again, and everything? Oh, God. Well, yeah. he, one of, the, one of the things that um, some of the, uh, the Gnostics believe is he's, he's here now. Yeah, yeah, he's here now doing his thing. Yeah. Right now? <laughs> and right now, who... His son is Osiris Gomez, the child of Litalantis and Samael, and the Gnostic movement currently is headed by his son. And one of the things that he did before he died was taught his son how to recognize him again when he comes back. And believe it or not, you can go on the internet and there's crazy people from Latin America claiming to be Samael. Just like if there's Elvis sightings and people claiming to be Elvis or whatever, there's people that actually claim to be Samael. There's like imposters that actually contact Gnostic centers like this one and say, I am someone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's kind of like a what? I remember the first time I encountered that, I was like, you got to be joking. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of someone else imposters that are running around saying that they're someone else. But apparently he's given knowledge to his son that if he ever needs to come forth, the, the son will be able to say, this is the real deal. This is not just an <laughs> imposter. So there you go. But he hasn't done that, so you don't know. Uh, we, we don't know. It's not like he would tell. No, but I mean, his son. His son hasn't said that he's... No, he hasn't said this guy right here is the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he hasn't done no, that. No, no. no. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's, um, if you spend enough time uh, in the Gnostic Center here and you get up to Second Chamber, we do events where we you know, go to Kitchener or go to Toronto or other people come here. And when you do that, you get a chance to meet some people that were closer to you. Um, Carlos at our center actually had met and spoke with Litalantis a bunch of times. Wolfgang spoke with Litalantis before. Um, there's people in the movement that have actually spent time with him before. There's a lady from, I believe, Toronto. She's probably maybe the 50s, early 60s. And she tells a story about how um, she was hanging out with her friends and she wasn't in the Gnostic movement, and her friends were kind of in the Gnostic movement, and they were a little bit teasing her about it because they had a special like a thing they were going to do at the Gnostic center that day. They were going to do a special ritual at the, the Gnostic temple, and they were kind of, you know, not making fun of her, but, but teasing her because she wasn't Gnostic. And uh, all her friends go off to do this, this, this secret magical thing that she couldn't know about, and she's, she's a younger girl, I think she was um, mid to late teens, and this is really upsetting to her that they've all gone away and left her and they were teasing her. Oh, you're not good enough to know this and they we're very special. And she's sitting on the steps of this building and she's crying. And somebody comes up and says, you know, my child, you know, what are you crying for? Why are you so upset? She's like, I really want to be in there and I really want to you know, be with my friends and I really want to receive this knowledge, but, you know, I can't and then blah, blah, blah. And then this person says, you know, stand up and come with me. And it was Master Samael. And he takes her right in and basically initiates her on the spot and places her with her friends. So, oh, that she was actually you know, experienced the guy, right? And for you know, for us, that one of the things that I really like about him is it's he's he's a real person. He's not like Jesus, where he was he real or was he not real? There's people that say I saw him, I was there, I heard him speak. You can see him on YouTube. You can read his books. He wasn't com he wasn't claiming to be anything special. I'm just an average guy. I'm a, you know, I'm basically a fallen bodhisattva. I'm not gifted. I wasn't born with, with, you know, angels and wise men coming to see me and that kind of stuff. I'm just a regular person, and I was able to raise myself up. And here's how you do it too. No fancy words. No hidden meanings. No double entendre. There it is. That's what you need to do. It's pretty simple. There's three things: the birth, the death, the sacrifice. That's it. Here's the practices. Here's the techniques. Here's what you need to do. Any questions about that? Yes? How do we know which books are not translated? <clears throat> if you look, somebody has a full list of, even in the back of some of the um, Spanish books, there's a full list. 
of all the books that he's written, and then he can compare that to the books that are available in English. I think he wrote about 75 books, and some books weren't even books, they were collections of letters that he'd written to other students, and I think about two-thirds of those, 50 or so, are available in English. I've been collecting them for about uh, nine years, and I think I have about 32 or 33. And if you do, or are interested in his books, if you see them, you have to buy them, because you might not see them again, unfortunately. That's the thing, if you really want to get into owning the books in like a published format, um, sometimes at the big events, like the ARV event that we did, there was books for sale there. Um, we're going to have a Christmas party on December 17th, and I think there's a center coming from Toronto. They'll probably bring some books as well. But if you really are into the books, it, like I've always told this to students, you see them, you buy them. <coughs> you don't think, well, maybe next time, because I've seen books where there was no next time. If I didn't buy it then, it would be gone. It might not be published anytime soon. But there's a lot of his more, um, um, his bigger books, the more popular books, are available on Amazon through Thelma Press. But some of the more, you know, not as popular stuff, some of the smaller books, uh, you never know when you're going to see him again. But as far as a complete list of English, I've never seen a complete list of English as compared against a complete list of Spanish. And like I said, I've been really trying, and I'm at probably not even half of everything that he wrote. Now there's bits and pieces on the CD, there's bits and pieces that people have passed around in Word documents and PDF documents and that kind of stuff, but as far as full published works, we're still not there. So the CD has some of the works in Spanish? <coughs> no, the CD is all the English all stuff. English. Yeah, all English stuff. And the good thing about that CD is Wolfgang's really familiar with the material and Wolfgang's fluent in Spanish and English, so he can verify oh, the translations. 